Hi there, and welcome to Unlit If I Want To. I'm Andrea Mari of Drea Renee Knits, and this is my weekly podcast where I do my best to answer some of your questions. And today we have a pretty good little variety of questions, so I think it's going to be a pretty fun episode. I am wearing, I'm going to stop creaking on this chair, I am wearing my birch pullover and paired with that is my brand new pattern that just released a couple days ago. This is the DRK Everyday Cowl. So this is what I have been knitting during my leave. I think I have knit at least five of them. I have four here to show you and I am getting my hand spun version on my needles next. So I'm super excited for that. I don't have the yarn over here, unfortunately. It is yarn I've shown you in the past, but I'll try to remember to bring that over to my desk for next time to share with you again in case you missed it, because it was, it was a few weeks ago. But anyways, welcome, and thank you for coming back if you are a regular visitor to On The If I Want To, and if this is your first time, I hope you enjoy and find some of these little tidbits helpful. All right, so, oh yeah, so back to the cowl. <laughs> this is the DRK Everyday Cowl, and basically it is the same style as my shift cowl, which I designed what feels like forever ago now, six years ago, I think. Um, so I love the style of this kind of cowl because it wears like a triangle shawl, but it's just so easy to style. You literally just pop it over your head. It's actually a cowl, so it is seamed in the back. I have more here to show you. This one is knit up in Ritual Dyes Marona in the color Jewel Weed, which I think is the most fabulous color and I was pretty stoked when I went through my lipstick I was like oh I happen to have like this exact color uh but I've also knit it striped and faded and soon to be hand spun so it can be a great stash buster I used a DK weight yarn because I feel like that's a yarn weight that a lot of us have kicking around in our stash I think you could absolutely also do it in worsted I would just size down to a size 5 needle and it's gonna give you a squishier cowl uh, with a bit more oomph but to be honest I kind of like that in this style of cowl I actually have mine folded down right now so you can wear it all gathered around your neck but I also love to fold mine to give it kind of the structure um because I like to just burrow in um so I think doing a really squishy one at a worsted weight on a size five instead of a size six like the DK um it's not going to be quite as drapey but I think it would be pretty delightful and as long as we're here, I might as well show you the other ones and then I'll start answering some questions. So the other version I have knit of this is this striped one. And I just love how this stripes turned out. You can't really see the true color, probably because I'm wearing this really bright red behind it. Um, but this is Pishkin from the Farmer's Daughter Fiber which is also a DK weight yarn. They actually have it listed as a DK slash light worsted, uh, but it knit up really similarly to the Morona from Ritual Dyes. And I loved using the two colors. I feel like it does this really interesting like optical effect with the slip stitches in the stripes with then the garter behind it. And so you can see this is the same shape as the shift cowl, as I said, and then it's seamed in the back. And I love, so the edges we seam is are actually slip stitches, but I love that once you seam it, it really reminds me of the I-cord edging. Sorry, my camera's having trouble deciding what to focus on. Uh, really similar to the I-cord there. So this is my striped version solid version and then I knit my son <laughs> a little faded version so this one used mini skeins and for the faded version I really wanted to do marling I haven't done a ton of marling fades in my designs 
but it's such a nice way to fade because I feel like it can give a really cohesive fade. And so I had some extra skeins, um, mini skeins left over from the Embrace Cowl project I did with Ching Fiber. And so I made my son a little version. So this pattern does include multiple sizes. It actually has four sizes. So it has like a child, toddler kind of size, a youth, and then an adult small and adult large. I'm wearing the adult small. Uh, the nice thing is, I mean, it's a cowl. It can, you can really play around with what size would fit a lot of different people, you know, like each size. So, uh, but I wanted to give some options because I felt like this is one of those patterns as I've already knit five myself that you can basically memorize and just knit it again and again and again. That's kind of the theme of all of my DRK patterns that are like the DRK Everyday series is I want them to be my go-to patterns that I can just turn to whenever I need that comfort knitting or the gift knitting, things like that. Um, so same ideas like my DRK Everyday Socks. And so here is another faded version. And this one, I love how it comes together in the back on that seam um, with the two like different sides of the fade colliding. But this one is again, the adult small for my size. And I actually for this one held two colors of sock weight yarn that was on the lighter side. There was, I want to say well into the 400s of yards per 100 grams. It might have even been like 450. I can't remember, but it was definitely a lighter fingering weight. So I held two strands together and then I actually, as you can see, you can see my fade isn't perfectly cohesive. You can see my quadrants. So what I did to blend it even more is I actually held it with a strand of lavender mohair that I had in my stash from Ritual Dyes in the color Holy Basil. And so the sock weight yarns from La Bien Aime in three colors. So I just grabbed like a three color fade and then I held it with the mohair as well. And I really like how it turned out. So anyways, that is the DRK Everyday Cowl. You can find it in my Ravelry shop and on my website. As always, I'll throw links below for you if you want to check it out. All right, let's answer some questions. So question number one, attaching pockets to block or not to block? The current project I'm asking about is a crochet project, but it will apply to my knitting projects as well. I'm crocheting a pocket scarf for a friend. I'm ready to attach the pockets. What would be a better practice? To block the scarf and pockets separately, then attach or attach the pockets first and then block the scarf. I'm worried if I block prior to attaching, I might block the pockets larger than the width of the scarf. Um, I would block first. So... I, before I do any kind of seaming in general, including with this cowl, I block and then seam. I just think it's a lot easier to seam those edges. You know, I'm not, I haven't done a ton of crocheting. I did more years and years ago, but I mean, 20 years ago, it's been a long time. So I, I don't feel like crochet wants to curl as much as like a knit edge would, but I could totally be wrong about that. So especially for knitted edges, it definitely can curl in on the sides. I'm sorry, I can hear my kids downstairs. Hopefully you can't. Um, so they can want to curl in on the side and I just, th just think it's a lot easier to seam when that's not happening. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and just sending a little message to my husband. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that family life. <laughs> Anyways, back to seeming. So I think it's a lot easier to seam post blocking. As far as being worried that something might grow too much, I would just block it to the exact size you want it. I mean, if it's gonna grow, it's gonna grow regardless of if you've already seamed it or not. 
Um, so I would just, that's when I'd pull out a ruler or a tape measure so that you're blocking it to the exact measurements you want. And whether that takes a little stretching or a little smush and padding to make sure that they are ending up the same size, um, both the end of the scarf where you're putting that pocket and the pocket itself. So that's what I would do. That's my rule of thumb at least. All right. When a designer, or this is question number two, by the way. When a designer instructs a knitter to knit, for example, two inches of ribbing, I have always assumed that meant two inches unstretched. But sometimes that amount of ribbing seems too skimpy when the garment is finished and worn. Any tips on how to deal with this? Um, so yeah, I think what I would do is I would gently stretch your ribbing. If you want a finished ribbing that is two inches in length, once we've blocked something, ribbing does open up. I mean, it's always going to pull in a little because it's ribbing, but it will open after blocking. It won't be nearly as scrunched as when you've originally knit it. So I do think it's nice to stretch it a little bit and then measure the length. Because as we've talked about in past episodes, when something is stretched horizontally, it grows shorter vertically. So I do like to give it a little tug. Um, you know, at the end, it's all kind of little details. It's definitely not gonna make or break your sweater. But if you really are like, I want that solid two inches of ribbing, then I would do a little bit of stretching and measuring so that you don't lose that once that ribbing opens up. But I also find that like my ribbing, I'll show you on the bottom of this sweater too. Like it doesn't lose too, too much. With, this is a two inch rib on the bottom here. And I actually have a measure tape. I'll measure right now and I'll see what it's like now that it's been worn a lot. I wear the sweater all the time. By the way, this sweater is Birch Hollow Fibers in the Sojourner base. I don't think I mentioned that um, earlier when I was talking about what I'm wearing. Yeah, and this is still perfectly two inches. Um, so I think that you'll find it's not going to change drastically, but I do like to give it a little stretch when you're measuring just to make sure it's as long as you want it to be. Next question is a spinning question. I am a new spinner and have completely gone down the rabbit hole. As much as I spin, I always end up making the same yarn, a two ply DK weight with low twist. I just bought a lazy Kate so I can start doing three plies, but I'm wondering what I can do to increase my twist. I always worry my beautiful colors will turn into rope. The yarns I have been attracted to recently have a lot of twist. Is there a good video that can help? So as far as a video, I'm just going to start there. I do love Jillian Moreno's ply class that she has over on Craftsy. So I took that and I think it's a fabulous class for plying in general for your spinning. It is a ply to spin the yarn you want to knit class. Um, so it is kind of geared towards knitters. Um, but I definitely found it really helpful and she will be able to give you much more solid advice because uh, she's an amazing spinner and spinning teacher. But at the end of the day, the only way to get more twist into your yarn is to either treadle faster so that you are letting more twist go in before it goes onto your bobbin. Um, or to like keep it off of the bobbin for longer to let that twist build up. And I completely understand what you are feeling because when I first started spinning, I completely overspun my first skein. I, and it was 100% rope. I mean, you could probably make armor out of it. <laughs> so I then overcompensated the other way and had a lot of spins that were too loose. Uh, the twist was too loose, I thought. And I do like a higher twist yarn. I like it to be nice and squishy and plumpy, but we don't want it to be rope. So one of the tips I got that I did find helpful was from my friend Katrina. And she mentioned that if it's over twisted, it starts to feel like beads between your fingers. So that's just a nice thing to kind of think about while you're plying. Like if it starts to feel like little beads, it is definitely over twisted. Um, but I think if I were you, 
it, it's kind of getting over that fear of the over twist. And since I started over twisting, it took me a little bit. I was really afraid that I was going to put too much twist in. And now I feel like I'm at a good place where I think our hand spun can take a little more twist than we think it can because we don't want to, like if you are trying to see how much twist is in your yarn as you're plying and you do the test where you kind of let it relax between your hand and the orifice of your wheel and so it kind of droops like this if it doesn't twist back on itself at all I think that's underplied and you're not going to have enough twist because you're going to lose some of that twist when you go to wash your yarn so I do put a little more twist than I think I should as I'm plying. And then after I wash it, it tends to be perfect. Um, but that also just comes with a lot of practice. And so I would recommend sampling. I would grab a braid of yarn and a braid of yarn, a braid of fiber. And I would just divide it into let's say four or whatever and just do a bunch doing different amounts of twist in each one see which one you like and I think that will also help you not worry about the over plying as much I think if you just like jump in and try it you know like adding that a little bit more twist but Jillian Marina will be able to give you more solid advice than me so I also definitely recommend checking out her class all right, question number four. This has nothing to do with knitting, <laughs> but I know that you also do a lot of cooking and I'm curious how you manage your own nutrition needs with your kids and husband. I have three children who are in, a pro who are in or approaching their teenage years and we all have very different dietary needs and issues. We have two vegans, two meat eaters, three lactose intolerant dairy-free people, and one hardcore cow's milk guy. I could go on and on. I'm wondering if you have any tips for meeting everyone's needs without cooking multiple meals at every meal. Um, I'm actually, before I forget, I am going to put in a link. To somebody that might be able to help. So I can relate. It's also hard being the one who has the food issues in our family. My family can eat gluten. They're pretty much fine with dairy. Um, so I sometimes I feel bad having them avoid the things I need to avoid. But we did turn our home into a gluten-free home. Um, sometimes they'll order pizza, but they eat it in a different room. They don't, we don't bring any gluten into our kitchen anymore. Cause basically I got sick enough where I was like, I need somewhere safe to eat that I just never have to worry if there's cross contamination. Um, so we do eat gluten-free in our kitchen. Uh, my family doesn't eat gluten-free all the time by any means, uh, but everything I cook is gluten-free and everything that's made in our kitchen is gluten-free. Um, so that's just kind of like, you know, to me, I mean, you do, okay, I was gonna say, it sounds like you have enough vegans and uh, lactose intolerance where maybe you could just take dairy out, but you did say you have one hardcore cow milk guy. So, I mean, for instance, my daughter only likes almond milk and my son only likes oat milk and they, do not like each other's milks. So we do buy two different milks. Um, so basically, it can be tricky. I try to make meals that can be broken down into components so that everyone can enjoy the components that they like or that suits their dietary needs. So for instance, like I love a bowl. I love to combine different things together and that's how I eat it. My kids do not want that combination thing happening. So we'll take the components of the meal that our my husband and I will eat and we'll break it down separately. Like I'll make a cauliflower fried rice with pineapple in it that I really like. For them, I make them regular rice and, and my husband too, he prefers regular rice. I'm kind of the only cauliflower rice eater, which I love it. I don't know what their problem is. But then I'll take like the pineapple that I'm putting into my fried rice and I'll have that separate for my kids because they love just like the pineapple. And so we do things like that that can kind of be broken down so that everyone can then make your own. So the person I want to recommend is Downshiftology. I actually just found her because I got glutened 
this was a couple months ago now, but it always takes me a couple days to realize it's happened because my main symptom when I've been exposed to gluten is a low grade headache. It's like a migraine, that's but a low grade migraine that can last anywhere from one to three weeks. And it always takes me like at least two days to realize I'm like, cause I'm not prone to headaches otherwise. I used to get migraines as a kid, but then they just went away. Um, so now it always takes me a hot minute to be like, why do I have this ongoing headache that won't go away? And then all, all the other symptoms that are happening will click into place and I'll be like, oh, that's what's happening. So last time that happened, I was like, I just wonder if there's anything I can do to support my system to get through this boost of inflammation. And I ended up finding downshiftology and that is the weirdest thing. I hope y'all can hear everything just fine. My headphones just did this weird thing where it was, anyways, you don't care. I won't go into it. I think we're back on track. So I ended up finding her because of that. She actually, she travels a ton and she has celiac and she was talking about gluten and what you can do to support yourself if you get gluten. And then I just started poking her. I'm like, oh, she's a food blogger and she has all these recipes. And then I found out that she actually has a massive, like multi-million following here on YouTube for her videos. I don't know how I'd never heard of her before, but she does these amazing meal prep videos that I think are some of the most useful meal prep videos I've ever seen. And basically what she does is she preps like 10 core ingredients. It's usually some protein, some hummus, and some like veggies, maybe some fruits. And the way she describes it though, is it's like having a buffet bar in your fridge. And I think that can work really, really well in a family that has differing needs. So if you can figure out the core things that you all can utilize, like maybe that is hummus and whatever veggies and fruits you can all have, maybe some grains if you do grains, whatever it is, and then just let everyone kind of combine them how they want to. I will also say our every single week go-to meal that's on every single meal plan is like a taco night because my kids will always eat like either a burrito or a taco or a quesadilla. I will easily throw together a bowl with similar ingredients. My husband will do something that he like nachos or a different kind of bowl for him. So I think it's just about having those components and then letting everyone else kind of um, combine them how they like them and add little things they might need. I mean, it might be a matter of having real cheese for the cow kid and dairy-free cheese for the lactose-free people in your family and the vegans in your family um, and just kind of figuring it out that way. But I feel like when it's, yeah, those components, it just becomes a little bit easier for everyone to be taken care of. Um, I also think not letting yourself be the only cook in your house. Uh, maybe you don't have that problem, but I love to cook and have for so long that I just kind of always do it. And it took a while for me to realize that it was adding stress because it could be really hard. Again, I talked a few weeks ago about how I always have decision fatigue and trying to decide on meals that all of us can eat when it feels like sometimes we never eat the same things felt challenging. So then having at least like two meals a week that my husband can make that everyone enjoys was so helpful. Um, so I think too, I also will say I keep, y'all know, I love like my journals. I have a spinning, knitting, sewing. I also have one in my kitchen and I've had one for years. My best friend, actually, when I moved to New Zealand back when I was like 20, gave me this little spiral bound notebook and it just had some recipes in it that she found. And it was actually when I was vegan, and I was plant-based. And so she put in a couple recipes that she'd found. She hand wrote them in there and I have had a little recipe journal in my kitchen ever since. And whenever I find a recipe that everyone can eat and enjoy in my family, it goes in the journal. So that's one of the main things I reference for, okay, when we're doing our meal plan. And I just meal plan at the beginning of every week. And I do think having a meal prep day on like a weekend day or whatever works for your schedule is really helpful 
to then get again those base components that everyone can kind of make their own thing out of so i hope that helps um but definitely check out Downshiftology because I, again, that just like think of your fridge as like a buffet. I just found that really helpful. I was like, oh, this is great because like I really love like this kind of style, like this bowl style, but I can use the same things to make my kids like spaghetti and meatballs, you know? So anyways, um, that link will be below if you want to check her out. She has a cookbook too. Okay, back to the knitting. Uh, ba, 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 in the la, da, da, da. Okay. My question is, I am 38 weeks pregnant and hoping to join the March to May Knit Along. Yay, congratulations, and I hope you can join. Don't put too much pressure on yourself once that baby comes. But if it's anything like my first baby, she napped a lot, and I actually got quite a bit of knitting done in those, in those early days. Um... But if you can't, that's okay too. Rest is really the thing to prioritize. I am done giving early parenthood <laughs> tips and back to the question. Um, I got your weekender pattern recently and thought it would be a good one with a more relaxed fit. In your opinion, should I knit the pattern based on my pre-pregnancy bust or go with that what I am at the moment? I'm not a super fast knitter and I'm not sure how much time I'll have once this little guy makes his debut, but I want to try. So I do think the Weekender is such a fabulous pattern to pick because it, it is, I call it my fancy sweatshirt. I think with the positive ease in there, I have worn mine over a fluctuation. I'm sure I even, did I knit it after Levi was born? I think I did, but I've definitely worn it with a fluctuating weight. Um, I mean, I've bet had a 20 pound difference in the lifespan of that sweater just for myself and I've always been able to wear it. So I think it's a really, really great option. Um, as far as the bust goes, it's a little bit of a tough question because your bust size is going to change with pregnancy and even more so once the baby arrives. So, and even more so depending on if you're planning to breastfeed. So, um, my chest size definitely changed drastically after I had my kids. Uh, while I was breastfeeding, my chest got really large and then afterwards they were smaller than they had been since I grew them. <laughs> So, um, it's a little hard to guide you on what bus size to choose just because it really depends on, I don't know what's going to happen with your bus size over the next few years. Um, I think I'm trying to think of what my pre bust was before I had kids compared to after. I think... So the nice thing about the Weekender is I do think you have some wiggle room there. It is size in approximately four inch or 10 centimeter jumps between sizes, if my memory serves. And so I do think you have some wiggle room. I would either do your pre-pregnancy bust if you felt like that was pretty stable so let's say you're like my whole life since adulthood I've been around like this bust size let's say 40 inches um I would probably go with that size or up one and I think you'll be pretty safe um but it's so hard to say because Every person is so different in the amount their body changes with having a baby. And then what happens after? I mean, I've, when I've spoken to my friends post-pregnancy, we all had such different um, post-pregnancy experiences with how our bodies changed. Uh, so again, I think the Weekender is a great one because of the fact that it's oversized. It's meant to be oversized. You know what I would almost look at now that I'm thinking about it? I would even maybe pick based on your arm measurement. So I would measure your bicep 
and I would see which sleeve size you would like best to fit over your upper arm. So I don't have that pattern in front of me, but you could even go measure if you, any other sweaters in your closet that you really like the um, sleeve on. The Weekender does have slim fit sleeves. That's one of the things to balance out the boxiness of that sweater and the body of that sweater. The sleeves are meant to fit a little more fitted. Um, so, but I would give yourself a couple inches of ease. Maybe two inches of ease might be nice. Uh, around the fullest part of your arm, which generally is around our bicep. Um, and I would maybe use that because I think if it fits you really nice in the sleeves, the body's going to drape. The thing about the shape of that sweater is it looks like a box, uh, but when you put your arms down, the fabric falls and drapes in a really, really nice way. Um, so that, that is actually what I think my suggestion would be is maybe base that on the sleeve size. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm going to go with. Uh, but congratulations. I hope that you have a wonderful labor experience and that you and baby are healthy and happy. And we would love to have you over in the knit along for as much or as little as you can make it there. All right, let's do a little bonus question this week. Where did the name Drea Renee Knits come, come from? And what is the inspiration story behind your company name? So it's not that exciting. <laughs> so my name's Andrea Renee. So when I lived in Austin, Texas, my friends all called me Drea. And I think I started like my Instagram and stuff shortly thereafter. So Drea Renee and I knit. <laughs> so Drea Renee knits. And you know, when I started, this, I didn't think it was going to become a real business. I was just like, I'm going to try and sell a couple patterns. I don't know. And so I didn't expect it to be what it is today. Maybe I would have put in some more thought <laughs> into the name if I had known where it would lead. But it very perfectly describes my business because it's me and I knit and I try to create knitting patterns that you all will love. So that's, that's it. That's the story behind my, um, my business name. I will say a funny little story is when I was in about second grade, my, I don't know which of my parents it was, it was probably my dad, said that originally I was supposed to be named Renee, not Andrea. And then at the hospital when my mom had me, she had a last minute, like, no, we're not naming her Renee. We're going to name her Andrea. Renee can be her middle name. So I had this little bee in my bonnet as, how old are you in second grade? Like six <laughs> that, or seven. I was like, I was meant to be a Renee. And so I told my entire class and my teacher that my name was Renee and that is what they should call me. And nobody knew about this until my parents went in for conferences. <laughs> my teacher was like, well, Renee. And they were like, who? <laughs> so careful what you tell your kids. Um, so anyways, Trey Renee Nets is me. But I guess that is all. I hope you check out my newest pattern. If you knit one, let me know how it goes. I hope you love it. I hope you knit a few of them. And most of all, I hope to see you back here next week. I hope you found this helpful. And my last hope, because I just seem to be full of them today, is I hope you get to make something this weekend, whether it be in the kitchen or on your needles or making memories with the people you love. I hope it's a good one and I'll see you later. Bye.